Welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you back for another Monticello for Kids live stream. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, this week, if you've been following on our other channels, we've been talking about uh, working and learning at home. Uh, and I'm excited to share more about that with you. My name is Laura uh, and I work in the education department at Monticello. Here's a picture of the famous west side of the house. Um, we are still closed to the public and so I'm working from home and excited um, to talk to you all today uh, about the history of Thomas Jefferson and his plantation. Uh, so there's a lot to learn there. Uh, and he had so many different ideas uh, particularly about his home office. It was full of gadgets and different designs. It's a really beautiful space. Uh, lots of fun scientific instruments there. And we've talked about science quite a bit over the last few weeks. And one of my favorite gadgets in this space is a tall item standing in the back right corner there. It's a revolving paper press or a used to be called a book stand once before we learned more about it. Uh, and this turns around and let Jefferson look at five different sources at once. I've always wanted one of these ever since I learned about it. I wish I'd had one while I was in school. That would have been really useful. Uh, and I certainly am kind of using a design of this now, while I'm working from home, I have my cookbook stand on my home office desk to keep notes up next to me. Uh, now, for a clue for what we're going to be talking about this week, some of you may have solved the code we gave you for the cipher wheel. Or maybe you are just a Jefferson expert and knew the answer to fill in the quote we gave you from Jefferson. So if you know the answer to the code, tell us in the comments. And throughout our time together, if you have any questions for us, or uh, wanna tell us where you're watching from, we would love to hear that. And the answer is indeed knowledge to that clue. One of you was well on top of this. Uh, so the full quote from Jefferson says, the field of knowledge is the common property of all mankind, uh, which is really exciting and inspirational to think about how information, wisdom, um, learning how things work together uh, belongs to everyone and is something for everyone to learn about. And this is something where we can examine how uh, sometimes uh, we are still working towards these ideas that Jefferson had, because as we'll see as we examine the history of Monticello, Jefferson wasn't always thinking about including everyone uh, in education. Uh, and that's something that we get to still work towards, just like his ideas uh, of all men being treated equally as they were created equally in the Declaration of Independence. So Jefferson loved learning. Um, there are a lot of adults working from home right now. We're particularly grateful for those adults who can't work from home right now and are in uh, essential positions in healthcare and grocery stores and many other jobs um, doing important work. And many students around the country have been learning from home right now. And that is certainly something that happened at Monticello, learning at home. Uh, and it looked pretty different 200 years ago. Right now, you can get on a video call with your teacher. Uh, you can do something like we're doing right now and watch a video live. Or um, there are a lot of different resources for learning online. But this isn't something that the children at Monticello can take advantage of uh, 200 years ago. So as you think about the differences between the past and the present, tell us, what do you think that students learned used for learning 200 years ago. I'd love to hear your ideas and what you're thinking about there. And we're going to talk about some of those things. One of the spaces where children were learning at Monticello is the South Square Room. It's named for its shape and where it was in the house. It's a very beautiful space. And this is where some of Jefferson's grandchildren went to school. Uh, they were homeschooled by their mother, Martha Jefferson Randolph. This is an artist's imagining of what that space might have looked like. Uh, and they would have been tutored later on, um, some of his grandsons before they went off to college. Uh, and 
we know a lot about what this looked like from a lot of different people's letters and recollections and stories. And one of them is depicted in this painting. We actually have a portrait of him. His name uh, was Isaac Granger Jefferson. He was enslaved at Monticello, owned by Thomas Jefferson. And when he was a young boy, one of his jobs on the plantation uh, was to stoke all of the fires in the house. So while Jefferson's grandchildren got to come in and learn and enjoy that space, Isaac uh, Granger wrote later in life about remembering sleeping on the floor so that he could wake up really early and start the fire for them. And that's certainly not fair and it's one of the things that we're gonna talk about today. Now, they were doing a lot of different tasks and learning in that picture. And I'll show you a couple of the things they might have used. Uh, this is a slate, like a small chalkboard that they could use uh, for practicing their writing, their letters, uh, and practice some math too. Maybe you've done some sidewalk chalk while you've been at home, left some encouraging messages for neighbors. Uh, women at the time particularly learned a lot about sewing. Um, so that was really an important task for them to learn about uh, so this is an example of a sampler. So practicing the alphabet and practicing sewing all at the same time. And then another interesting thing to think about, particularly for Thomas Jefferson's family, uh, is time in how they spent their time uh, learning and working. And one of the things that Jefferson gave to his grandchildren was a pocket watch so that they could know exactly what time it was and keep up with all of their work and all of the different things he wanted them to be working on. One of Jefferson's grandsons said he was a miser of his time. Um, that means someone who's really careful and maybe a little grumpy about it wants to make sure that he uh, accounted for all of it and used it well. Uh, so I want to hear some of the ideas you all had for how students were learning at home uh, 200 years ago. So I'd love to see some of your answers. And we'll take a look at how Jefferson thought uh, that his grandchildren should be using their time. A great example of how Jefferson monitored their learning is actually an example of distance learning, uh, believe it or not. Jefferson was not always with his family. And so he wrote a letter to his daughter, Martha Jefferson Randolph, who we already mentioned. Uh, and she was uh, the teacher in Jefferson's retirement years for her children, but while she was a student, uh, Jefferson wrote her this letter and we're gonna put it up on the screen for you and I will hold my copy closer so we can read it. Stories are certainly a way to learn then and now. I love that answer, that's a great insight. So Jefferson's schedule for his daughter uh, was that from eight to 10, she should practice music. From 10 to one, she should dance one day and draw another. So she should alternate day to day between those two tasks. From one to two o'clock, she should draw on the day she dances and write a letter the next day. So another alternating schedule. There's a little break and then from three to four, she was to read French, so learning languages. Oh, another good answer here, learning from books. That's certainly something we can still do. From four to five, she was to exercise herself in music again. So a lot of learning of music. And then from five until bedtime, she was to read English, write, etc. cetera. Uh, so that is certainly a lot of reading and writing to do. Jefferson did not leave uh, much time in here for breaks or snacks uh, or getting outside, which are some of my favorite parts of the day. Um, but it's a very careful schedule and this was his distance learning plan for his daughter. Uh, and there's certainly a lot of reading uh, involved in learning in the past and learning now. Uh, so perhaps you've gotten a chance to do uh, more reading while you've been at home. Perhaps you've gotten to read something 
about what you love to learn about. Uh, so I'd love to hear what one of your favorite books is. Uh, and Jefferson certainly loved books, shared them with his grandchildren, and felt that that was essential um, to, the free, to the future of education in the country. Now, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about how not all of the children living at Monticello were getting to learn in that South Square classroom. Many of the children living at Monticello were enslaved, owned by Thomas Jefferson, and that included some of his own family. Later in life, Jefferson was the father of six of the enslaved children living at Monticello, and four of them lived to be adults. His medicine was very different back then, and uh, many people died young. Their mother was a woman named Sally Hemings, uh, and their four children who lived to adulthood uh, were Beverly, Harriet, Madison, and Eston Hemings. Uh, and they had very different lives from their own family members by Jefferson's two older daughters. Um, so his sons were working with their uncle uh, in the woodworking shop, uh, being apprenticed there, and then the daughter, Beverly Hemings, worked in the textile factory. Um, we'll show you a picture of that space. It's one of the original structures left on the mountaintop, a stone building, and inside of it, uh, women of all ages, starting from about the age of 10, worked spinning and weaving fibers into fabric to be used on the plantation, uh, which is a lot of work. Um, so I'll give you an idea of what this looked like for them. They worked with a variety of different fibers, including uh, flax, which comes from a plant. This is what it looks like sort of straight off the plant after it's been processed. Uh, and a lot of what they were working with was wool, which makes a strong and um, warm, if not itchy, fabric. And it starts off extremely dirty coming off of the sheep. And then it has to be cleaned, which takes quite a while. My friend Liz taught me a lot about this. And so then it finally looks like this, but that's hardly ready to be turned into fabric. So instead, or so next, it has to be carded on these enormous paddles that have tiny teeth on them uh, and then pulled to detangle and straighten it out before it can be woven into a yarn that can then be made into a fabric. So it's an enormous amount of work that was being done by children at Monticello. And that is certainly not fair. Um, and this is part of what's difficult to think about when it comes to the history of Jefferson and Monticello. Um, this is not a fair treatment or um, a fulfillment of Jefferson's ideas of all men are created equal. And Jefferson's own children by Sally Hemings weren't freed until um, much later in life they were freed as adults. Jefferson made the choice to keep them enslaved uh, while they were children. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. But what's important to keep in mind as we study history is how much has changed since then. Uh, for example, Jefferson had a lot of really good ideas about knowledge and education and loved the idea of public education. In fact, he started a school here in Charlottesville called the University of Virginia. Uh, and when Jefferson started this school, he was not thinking about the field of knowledge truly being the common property of all mankind. It was only um, wealthy white sons who were able to go to this beautiful school. Uh, but now students from all over the world of every ethnicity and gender and walk of life uh, can come to this place and help make those changes possible uh, and really work to change the world. Uh, we uh, love having UVA nearby and very much miss having the students in town while everything is closed. And we're excited for them to be able to come back safely uh, someday. Now, as we think about learning, this is something that learning and fun and being kids has been true for kids of all walks of life throughout history. So whether free or enslaved, uh, enslaved children weren't 
defined by the jobs given to them. And they found ways to spend time with their family and to learn and have fun. Uh, someone who certainly found a way to learn was another uh, young man who was owned by Thomas Jefferson as a young child, Peter Fawcett. Uh, and he learned to read, we're not sure how, and learned to write. He taught others how to read and write and would even uh, forge paperwork, so um, create paperwork for others so that they could go free and escape slavery. So he's a really inspirational uh, person in the history of Monticello. And he grew up as a young child on Mulberry Row, the center of the enslaved community near the house at Monticello. Uh, and both free and enslaved children found ways to have fun, even without all of the technology we have now. So we know that um, children had dominoes to play with. We have found marbles in the stories of Jefferson's uh, family and in the archaeology of Mulberry Row. These are made out of clay, so they look a little different from marbles that you might be thinking of, uh, but they certainly remind me of that thick red clay that we have on the mountaintop here in Central Virginia. Uh, and a very common colonial toy is called a ball in a cup, um, and this is a particularly tricky one. The ball has a hole in it so that you can try and swing it and balance it on this flat piece on this side or flip it all over and a true expert can land it onto the post. I have been trying this for six years and I'm very, very bad at it. Um, but I've seen some true experts get it, um, land it over and over and over again which is very impressive. And this is actually a really simple toy that you can recreate at home yourself. Uh, and our friends at Colonial Williamsburg have put together a great set of easy uh, instructions for making your own toys. I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself. I remember that I'd asked you about favorite books. Uh, a favorite book is Harry Potter I'm seeing um, from one watcher on YouTube. That is one of my favorite reads as well, Percy Jackson, another exciting series. And that gives you lots of books to read all in a row. I love rereading some of those favorites too. Uh, that's always familiar and comforting. Reading and learning about outer space is certainly a lot of fun. I'm excited for nights when I can get back together with friends. Uh, one of my friends has a telescope, so we're really hoping to get back outside. Uh, Hannah's favorite book is Pippi Longstocking. That's always a fun one. Uh, the song from the old movie always gets stuck in my head. Uh, so there's a lot of different books uh, to learn from. Uh, and I love that that's something that you all have been doing while at home. I've certainly been doing plenty of reading too. Now, to make your own ball and cup game, it's very simple. I made one earlier out of a recycled yogurt container, a piece of yarn, two pieces of aluminum foil, and a piece of tape. So I'm gonna make another one with you right now. And this is very easy and a lot of flexible options for this one. Um, I saw alternate instructions that use the tube out of toilet paper or paper towels, uh, or you could use a small paper cup, whatever you've got around. So I poked a hole in the bottom of a yogurt cup. You wanna have a grown up do that for you. And then I'm just gonna hold it down with a piece of tape inside. You can tie a nice thick knot in the yarn too so that it can't move. And then on this end, I'm gonna take one piece of aluminum foil, fold it a couple times, and I'm gonna wrap the yarn around the end and tie it in a loose knot. I don't wanna rip the foil. And then I'm just gonna bunch it up. And when I tried this earlier, I learned that one piece of foil was not enough. This is another way to try the experimenting and estimating we talked about last week, playing with 
weight uh, and how long the string should be to have it succeed, how heavy the aluminum foil needs to be for it to work. So I'm gonna wrap another piece around to make it a little stronger. And if you have any questions for us, uh, we would love to answer those before we say goodbye today. So if you have any questions for us, please let us know in the comments. I will try and answer them. So that was really easy. That took me, what, two minutes? Our younger friends might enjoy getting to decorate it a bit. Uh, you could have friends do this um, and you could all get on a video call and have a competition. Like I said, I'm still really bad at this, even after six years of practice. Uh, I'm gonna use the one that I made earlier because I know I got it in at least once. Um, some folks recommend getting it spinning before popping it sort of straight up is their recommendation. Nope, I just threw it that time, that's cheating. See, there we go. What types of foods would they have at schools? Uh, so because most folks were being tutored or learning at home, they had whatever they were having uh, at home for lunch that day. We know that at Monticello, the two big meals of the day were breakfast and dinner um, and lunch, uh, which was actually called dinner and dinner was called supper, uh, was a smaller meal. We don't know of Thomas Jefferson personally educating any of his slaves or arranging for their education. That would have been very unusual. Jefferson wrote about uh, being very skeptical about enslaved people learning to read and write. It did not become illegal to teach enslaved people to learn to read until after Jefferson's lifetime. That said, we know of some exceptions. Uh, John Hemings, who is the woodworker uh, at Monticello, a younger brother of Sally Hemings, knew how to read and write and wrote letters back and forth with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, we don't know how John Hemings learned, but we know that uh, that worked to Jefferson's advantage so he could hear about projects going on while he was traveling and away. Well, any other questions roll in, I'll let you all know that we've got some extra resources for you on our website today. Uh, that can be found at monticello.org slash kids dash live stream. Uh, and there you'll find the instructions for recreating all sorts of colonial games on the Colonial Williamsburg website. Uh, a great lesson plan from a teacher we've worked with at Monticello on examining Jefferson's words about education. Uh, and you can take a closer look at those primary sources. And we've also linked to where you can read the memoirs of Isaac Granger Jefferson, Peter Fawcett, Madison Hemings, and uh, more enslaved individuals who lived at Monticello and their descendants. Uh, and if you don't feel like uh, making your own ball in a cup game, there is also a spot on our website where you can go to our shop and buy some of our favorite books and games as well. Uh, they did not have traditional grade levels yet. Uh, Jefferson wrote a few different proposals for public education in Virginia uh, that didn't become uh, law in his lifetime. So traditional grade levels were still uh, a few years out in the history of America. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. How many people were there at Monticello? There were usually about 130 to 150 people living on those 5,000 acres at about about eight square miles of land uh, at any given point in time. Uh, and we think that some of the enslaved people did teach themselves uh, or learned from other enslaved people. So we don't uh, get to learn as many of the details of those stories because uh, we don't have as many of their records and we wish that we did. So thank you all for so many questions. If you have other questions, please leave us them for us in the comments and we will go back and answer you and add more information for you. You can look at those resources online. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us today.